Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, I'm Michael North, and this is Asia Pacific Business Strategies. In this program, we try to identify the leaders for now and for the future of science and business and culture based mainly here in Hawaii, but radiating out from this center of the Pacific to North America to the West Coast and to all of the US and then to Asia. We try to find the connections and how they're typically made here in the nexus, which is Honolulu, Hawaii. So I wanna welcome you to uh, the, cent the Global Center here. Um, we have a very interesting guest here from uh, uh, one of our local banks and his name is Anthony Lay and he has a he has a title that to many people might seem a little opaque. He's a data analyst. Sounds really exciting, right? Sounds like being an accountant or something. But actually, I think that your profession is, is very interesting. It has a lot of impact on all of our lives in ways that we don't really understand. People have heard the term big data, right? And you deal in big data all the time. And for, in your job, you try to figure out how to use big data in a way to serve your clients in a more intelligent way, how to have foresight into their needs, how to fulfill their needs when they arise. Is that about correct? Have I got that right? Yes, definitely. First of all, thank you for having me. And as you mentioned, um, I, I would say big data is a, a, a buzzword. Yeah. Um, basically, using um, data science and analytics to um, make better decision for um, for business. Yeah. So, give me an example. Like, what have you been working on recently? Um, so, there's, um, um, f for example, um, in in my educations, right? Um, I taking classes online that you know. Um, train me to better perform at work, oh. right? In terms of machine learning and you know, computer vision and so on and so forth. Oh. So what does the computer tell you that you don't already know? When you analyze the data, what can you learn from a big amount of data or um, a long series of data that you can't know just from your own, from your own self? Right, so lots of the time that you know, at work, at you know, education, um, I deal with data in a very high dimension, right? Mm -hmm. So it is often too helpful to visualize them, right? There's techniques that visualize data so that you can look at the data then before you making any judgment. Right? Oh, so people feel that they have an intuitive feel for how things are going and what you provide is an objective check on people's sense of what information means. Right. I mean, one example that, uh, that might be something that you would work on would be looking at all of the bank's customers and based on past patterns, being able to anticipate which ones might be uh, looking for an auto loan at a given time, right? And you can, you can know or you can narrow down the likelihood based on past patterns of many people who have gotten auto loans and then you can look at all the current customers and say, okay, here's a, here's a thousand customers that we have that in the next year might be looking for auto loans. Is that a sort of an example of what you might do with the data? Yeah, um, one of the traditional, I, I think that, that definitely um, could be a one of example. One of the traditional example that um, banking has been using for a long time is um, the so-called so FICO score. Yeah. Based on- The FICO, uh, FICO. Yeah, based on, yeah, based on lots of um, attributes, information to, you know, um, to understand the credit worthiness of the customer. Right? Yeah. But um, that, that is basically how, um, in general, right, banks make this, uh, credit decisions. Uh-huh. Um, 
Of course, big data has been in the news a fair amount recently, and sometimes in not such a great way. We all know, or we think, that Google is watching us, and Facebook is watching us, and everything that we do online is being tracked, and so on. Mm -hmm. And we know what happened with this company in, uh, in uh, New York, Cambridge Analytics, that got involved with Facebook data, and there was a big political uproar about how they used that information in ways that are questionable, ethically, right. you know. Um, you talk to us a little bit about, uh, about the ethics of banking and data, and I know that's something that you think about. I think um, um, currently the internet sector, particularly as you mentioned Facebook and Google, um, is very interesting. So if you look at their, their company uh, financials, the profit margin is very high. So one of the, the reasons I believe is that they're utilizing um, consumer data to do a lot of interesting stuff, right, to improve their margin, right? Mm -hmm. um, with this scandal coming, uh, uh, you know, happen, um, there may be regulations that um, if they decided to use, you know, consumer data in certain way, you may need to pay for it. And that's actually start up that, um, Give financial, uh, give consumer the power to be able to harness those. Um, yeah. They are willing to if you as a consumer, if you are willing to sell your data, and here is here is the data for um, Google, and Google here is the monetary compensation for the consumer. Right. So, do you think it's important that the consumer has control over their data? Definitely. Yeah. You know, if you've been watching just in recent weeks since that political thing that we're talking about went through with Facebook. Um, Facebook has been sending out messages and emails to all their subscribers saying, we've got new ways for you to control your security settings, the data, who you share it with, how and when, and who, how confidential it is. Um, I think it's a good idea to, to do a security audit mm -hmm. if you're active on the internet, to do an audit from time to time about what you're showing to the world. Would you agree? Right. I definitely agree. I think that's a, a blurry line here, right? Um, let's say if you, are, if you, for example, data, data means it could be an age for a customer, right? And it could be also a derivative of this data, right? That means based on your activity. A face, derivative of yeah, that. Uh -huh. you, a Facebook think you are a Democrat, let's say, right? Yeah. Does that particular piece of data belongs to you or belongs to Facebook, right? Uh, right. So that those are the interesting blurry lines that not right. only in terms of security, but um, those ownership of the data. Right. So if you look at your data and you see, oh, I'm 35 years old and I'm a Democrat, and I live in Columbus, Ohio, you might not want to share all three of those pieces of information together with Facebook, because that could make you a target for right. people who are doing fundraising and coming at you with issues and so on. Um, I think it's a really good idea for people to be um, sort of defensive about the, how they share their data. Is that right. correct? Right, I think, but to be fair, right, um, with all the media mentioned, uh, Facebook actually taking you know measures to, to uh, as far as I have you know friends and works there, um, they actually taking measures to to uh, step up the the protection for for consumer data. Yeah. At the same time, we have to recognize that Facebook is a business. They employ thousands of people who earn good salaries all over the world, all different languages, and so on. Their platform is very expensive to build and maintain and right. keep making it smarter and smarter. And there are lots of benefits for us. And we have to respect the fact that to some extent it's our data that allows them to generate the income that makes the Facebook platform or LinkedIn or YouTube or all these services that makes it possible. So it's kind of a balance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a balance between business logic and ethics and privacy that I, I find is a very interesting space. Definitely. And so how do you deal with your own personal data on the internet? Do you show everybody everything? Well, I actually pretty conservative in terms of this space. Um, um, I don't use Facebook as much as I used to be, right? 
and I do check my security setting, and uh -huh. so on and so forth. And there's also um, worth mentioning is that the, this generation, um, the millennials as well as the even younger uh, generation, they tend to care less about the, yeah. the data privacy than the senior one. Right. right. Why that, is that? Um, I. My intuition tells me they just get used to it, right? When they first, um, yeah. you know, have experience of with all this um, yeah. technology, it's like. So their social life as they're growing up, you know, three, four years old, they're already using their phones, right? Right. It's all based on what they share with their friends online. So their existence as social beings is partly the traditional, you know, their kids running around in the playroom, right. in the playground playing, but they're also kids running around on the virtual playground in the whole world. And I know that there are kids in China who have friends in Bangladesh and Brazil and New York, right, that they've never met and never will, but mm -hmm. they will still be friends. Right. So that could partly explain why they want to be more open with their data. Right. I do because, Yeah, because they want to, they, they come from a, a sort of a sharing economy that is different from the economy that has been the, the normal economy for the last 6,000 years since there's been right, economy. Right, right. What a big change. Isn't that amazing? Just over the last 10 or 15 years since social media started to emerge. Mm -hmm. And you're kind of in the middle of that wave, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You, you remember the old style, right. but you're, kind, you're well adapted to the new style. You're right. So you're in a very interesting place. I think you have, uh, you have what could be a really amazing future because you have a lot of, well, let's talk about your education. Georgia Tech and UH, conventional schools, right? right? But also as a badge of your sort of half millennial status, you've done a lot of education virtual, right? right? You've used edX and Coursera to take courses that, are they used as uh, degree credit or professional development? How are they used? Oh, so most of the time, um, I'm just looking for online, online education and training to further my um, education and experience and, and so, on, so on and so forth. That's the major objective, as well as trying to satisfy my curiosity as well, right? <clears throat> yeah. Right, so, yeah. But I know that the edX one, for example, was affiliated mm. with UC Berkeley. Right. Right. So do you get a UCB credit for the course that you took? So um, I believe this online education platform is still um, sort of an initial stage. The one that I'm, uh, I took is not credited. But it does have a, a certification, right? Um, now, um, some of the program, for example, they have, in edX, I believe they have a so-called MicroMaster program. Uh -huh. That if you if you finish that particular program, and if you are apply for um, to a particular college, those can serve as a legitimate credit. Oh, so okay. that's um, actually um, a. a Evolving, improving, you know, in terms of uh, credential for those certification. Right. You had another uh, a Coursera course you did at John Ho Johns Hopkins. What was that course that you did? That is the data science um, oh. specialization that comes with um, a, a list of course, right? That comes with um, how to uh, clean and collect data, how do you, you visualize data, oh. as well as how do you build model and how do you build data products that serve the needs? Right, so even if it's not formally accredited, your completion, your successful completion of a course like that can go on your resume, can go on a, as a line on your resume. So for future employers, they will value that, that you took the initiative to take what is probably a pretty difficult course from Johns Hopkins. You would expect them to be pretty rigorous and detailed. Right. There's some sleepless night. Yeah, <laughs> really? So how would you compare? Is it better or not so good? How is it different from, say, going to the same class at UH? That is definitely uh, different, right? Um, there's many perspectives that can, you know, talk about it, but I guess we can 
Yeah, let's take a quick break and we'll be back for a moment with Anthony Lay to talk more about education. Hey, Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff. But I really like energy stuff, so I'm going to keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're going to talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're going to definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner. How we can make the world a better place, about. just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m on Friday afternoons, and then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up, and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. We're back with Anthony Lay, and we're getting into a good rhythm here, Anthony. Um, let's talk about formal education, especially technical education. Um, compare the relative advantages and disadvantages of taking a course, let's say locally here at University of Hawaii, and taking essentially the same course through Johns Hopkins online with Coursera. What are the, the advantages and the trade-offs? Right, so those are totally, um, not totally different. That's definitely, there's some differences, right? For um, online education, there's an advantage for being a low cost, right? If you think of, uh -huh. you have a, uh, a perform, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can, with that on, online perform, you can serve 10,000, maybe a million uh, students yeah. in the same perform, right? For um, traditional education uh, in classroom, there's a limited scale. Maybe 50 at a time. Right, exactly. Yeah. So um, in a cost perspective, um, online education is definitely you know, wins over yeah. traditional education, right? And um, and it depends on the subject, right? Um, for example, uh, let's say computer science, right? Um, you basically you do work, and you get feedback from um, from your mentor, and you can do exam online. Those are some of the subject are a gear better works toward online, you know, yeah. uh, perform. But some of them are, are not so good, like it's better suit for traditional. So for example, if you're doing chemistry, um, you, have, you have to go to your lab, and at home you just have limited right. equipment to, to perform lab right. you know, experiments. You just have your kitchen. Right, right, yeah. right. So for example, like, uh, um, a master's degree in a business administration, one of the important thing in MBA is a networking, right? So mm. in, in terms of networking, it's a little bit limited in that sense for online education. So uh -huh. it definitely has uh, its advantage and disadvantage for yeah. both online and you know, traditional educations. Do you think it would be a good idea for students to have a kind of a hybrid strategy where they enroll in a formal education and then complement it with uh, electronic, with distance learning as well? Yeah, definitely. So nowadays, particularly, men as you mentioned, technology, um, technology is always evolving, right? They always have a new programming language coming from the corner, and you know it serves a particular purpose. Then, as um, as working in, in 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 the in the sector, you really have to keep up, right? In yeah. another perspective, is that nowadays there's um, edX or Coursera, they have I believe edX have uh, AP class AP class they can take for university educations. So if you are a very motivated high school student, you actually can take some credit on those perform and eventually um, lift you up in, in when you arrive in university. Oh, okay. Very, very different sort of strategy than the traditional one where you just check into a university, you're, you're in your dorm, you follow the curriculum, you go to certain classes, you're done, you're out. Um, modern uh, 21st century education is a lot different. Right. Okay, you wrote a piece of software that I found rather interesting. It's uh, 
Uh, it has a very simple purpose. It is a very complex under the hood, I'm sure. Um, tell us about that, and maybe we can bring up the first screen so you can sure. talk about that. What are we looking at here, Anthony? Yeah, so basically, um, it goes back to my education. In my undergrad, um, I did my math as well as you know finance. So one of the, my interests is financial engineering as well as you know finance in general, mm. right? So what you have you're seeing right here is really a comparison of the two performance of um, two stock or so-called security, right? So if you um, so we've got Apple and we've got the S and P, right. right? What you see AAPL is the ticker for Apple and SPY is the SP five hundred um, ETF, right? Right. So basically, you can. Uh, compare two particular stock within two given uh, given time slide, right? And you so to here we've got from the first of January two thousand fifteen to the seventh of or the first of July two thousand eighteen. So basically three and a half years. Can we zoom that out and show? Okay, so here's the time series. And Apple is red, and the S and P is black. Right. I think it's the opposite. Oh, the opposite? Apple okay. is the back and red is the Oh, okay. Right, right, right. So what does this time series tell us? What does this graph tell us? Right. Um, so basically, um, you can see um, a, a, very in, uh, a very simple uh, inference. You can basically tell uh, individual stock is much more volatile than yeah. a sing, single yeah. stock. Um, but they're pretty highly co correlated at some times, right? right? You can see through 2015 and 2016, they were moving up and down pretty much together. But more recently, in the last year, year and a half, they've diverged right. somewhat from each other. So that teaches you something about the stage of growth that Apple is in with relative to the rest of the market. Exactly. OK, let's have a look at the next um, graphic here. And in this one, uh, we've got Apple compared to Amazon, two stocks, two differently different industries but kind of in a similar stage of growth, right? And they're both cyberspace stocks, and we've still got the same time series. So let's zoom out and see what this tells us. Give us a comment on the red and the black here. Yeah, um, as you can see, Amazon is really outperforming, outperformed the rest of the market. Yeah. So um, there's an analysis done by, you know, some... Um, they're outperforming Apple. Yeah. and there's, I think uh, a loss of um, a lately performance of S and P five hundred uh, a contribute from you know a s four particular company and yeah. Amazon is definitely one of them. Right. Actually, if you take Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, Facebook, yeah. the Fang stocks, yeah. then you have a really large segment of the high tech right. market. What's the what are the lines in the bottom below there? Are they vol? Is that volume? Yeah. Those. Um, that basically tells you the volatility of the financial security, as well as the, the bottom one, it tells you um, the drawdown, meaning from the peak, the, from the last peak, how much did it go down, right? Oh, okay. It gives you a sense of what is the bottom, right? Right. Okay, let's zoom back out again. We've got another one to look at here. And in this example, we're comparing IBM big old-time American tech stock, right? 120 years old company. And MSCI, which is an index of emerging nations stocks, right? And China was recently added to the MSCI. The, the A shares of much of China's securities industries were recently added to the MSCI. And we've got the same three and a half year timescape. Let's zoom back and see what this tells us. What do we see here, Anthony? Yeah, definitely. Um, emerging market is, you know, have been outperformed IPM. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's almost no place at which you would have been better holding IBM than invested in the MSCI, right? Right. The MSCI, you can see, has a little more volatility to it. IBM is fairly steady, although there were some, there were some pretty steep declines mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. IBM had, but. Recently, IBM has consolidated its position. They, they formed a bottom, as they like to say, right. in the market. They're working very hard on the cloud yeah. technology. Yeah, and they're doing well in cloud technology. Yeah. OK, I think we have one more. Let's zoom back again. 
And I think with this one, we left the stocks the same, but we made it only for one year. So we could zoom in just, so we just looked at three and a half years. Now we look at just a one year. So you're gonna see more ups and downs and you can analyze the correlation in terms of recent performance. So you wrote this for your own education in the middle of the night when you had nothing else to do? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I use it mostly compared to uh, different ETFs. Right, because oh. um, oftentimes exchange traded funds. Right, yeah. right, right. So like, oftentimes with S and P five hundred, you have different three, four different ETFs. So uh, as a savvy uh, investor, um, you, you want to invest in you know better, better performance as well as a lower cost. And this particular tool really gives me an understanding or the data visualization on once you look at it, uh, which ETF is a little bit better choice. So you looked out and you didn't really find anything in the market that was able to tell you that? And you, so you wrote your own? Yes, I think, I believe Google wrote, <clears throat> recently wrote out a, a very similar software. Uh -huh. But at the time when I created it, what, what, there was a no. Yeah, and it must be Java under the hood because it recalculates instantly as you change the variables. Yes, it's a very similar um, programming language called R. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, so Anthony, a little bit about you personally. Your uh, last name is Lei, but that doesn't mean Lei like in flower Lei. That is a Chinese name, and you're originally from Macau, right? You right. were born in Macau. Where did your family come from before Macau? Oh, mm, my parents come from China. Yeah, which part? Um, Zhongshan. Zhongshan. What yeah. province is that? It's uh, Guangdong. Guangdong. Yep. Okay. So you're born in Macau. You decided at a certain point after going to university there, you decided to come to America. Why did you come to America? What were you looking for, and did you find it? Oh, yeah. Um, that's definitely a, a good question. Um, I mostly come here for, for education as well as you know, um, personal experience and a lot of, uh, of obviously opportunities as well, right? Yeah. Did you find the opportunity? Did you find the good education? Yeah, definitely education yeah. as you, we have been all talking about, yeah. So you're living the American dream, but it's also kind of the Chinese dream as well. Right, right. right. So welcome to America. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> Thank you. you. You make a big contribution and your brain and your heart are really important part of our success here in Hawaii. Sure. And I hope that your professional success continues. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you so much for being with us here on Asia Pacific Business Strategies, and we'll see you again soon. Take care.